Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Saturday, everybody. First of all, as many of you can probably see, the channel has hit forty thousand subscribers. This, for me, is a very humbling and uh, encouraging milestone. When I started this channel, like I've said before, I thought the content would be very niche and, frankly, quite nerdy. And that maybe I would be fortunate if a few hundred people took the time to listen to what I had to say. I did not expect it to grow into the thousands, let alone the、uh, tens of thousands which we have now. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all for the incredible support. Just by watching and liking and sharing these videos, it's been truly humbling for me, and it's been an incredible. Honor and privilege to be able to produce this content for you all. Just by watching these episodes, I'm tremendously appreciative, but I do want to express a very uh, special uh, sense of gratitude and thanks to those who provide the financial support, which is the primary means by which these episodes are possible. If it wasn't for that support, I don't think I would be able to produce this every day. So、uh, thank you, especially to those members of the community, but for everyone. Everyone who watches, likes, shares, thank you so much for making this channel possible. But with that said, let's move into today's episode of China Update. With so much attention on AI among investors and the public alike this last week or so, it's worth taking some time in today's video to discuss the industry in China and specifically whether Chinese AI companies are in a bubble. This is a question that more than a few in the industry are now asking. First of all, the context. After a lot of hype initially in AI generally due to ChatGPT, Google's demonstration of its AI chatbot on Thursday underwhelmed investors, resulting in the biggest drop in its parent's shares in months. This had flow-on effects for Chinese players in the artificial intelligence-related sector too. Baidu Inc. plunged as much as 8.5 percent in Hong Kong. As we can see, it wasn't the only one to see share prices fall. AI-related stocks have garnered intense investor interest in China amid speculation about potential Chinese alternatives to ChatGPT, a bot designed to provide realistic answers to questions using technologies like deep learning and natural language processing. A slew of Chinese firms, from Alibaba Group Holdings Limited to NetEase Inc., have also announced this week that they are developing Chat GPT-like services. However, there is growing concern that Chinese AI stocks. Maybe in a bubble. Indeed, state media in several recent articles has warned investors about the risks involved in investing in the new hot but untested sector. Regulators have also warned investors against quote blind speculation in the sector. End quote. Commentators have observed too that with the recent Chat GPT hype, lots of PRC stocks have been popping lately because of real or claimed AI products. For example, on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, one well-performing company was Hanwang Technology, a company that specializes in making drawing tables, e-readers, and scanners. Which reached its daily price increase limit of 10% for seven consecutive trading days in early February. Analysts point out that the price jumps started after the device maker announced that it was looking to expand into several AI technologies. In a similar case, after Nasdaq-listed luxury e-commerce platform Seiko announced last week that it would develop AI-generated content to provide customer service solutions. Its stock price soared 127 percent, but of course prices go two ways, and some Chinese AI companies have seen stock prices plunge as regulators begin asking inconvenient questions. For example, Chinese financial media outlet Yizhai writes yesterday that after Shanghai-based CloudWalk. Which has seen its shares climb 120 percent this year, was required to admit that it is not working with San Francisco-based OpenAI. Its price dropped. Beijing-based Haitian Reisheng also saw investors dump shares after the exchange required that it clarify that it doesn't directly develop AI algorithms or applications. Ultimately, if there is a bubble in the industry, like any bubble in a new emerging sector. There will be winning companies and losing companies. Investors just normally don't know which is which until after the sector is washed out, and with regulatory approval and state subsidies, the technology could well take off in China. Quote, the verdict on China's self-developed ChatGPT-style tools, 
which looked to enter the market this year after media reported February 8 that Alibaba is testing its application, similar to NetEase, might only emerge in 2024 as competition spurs innovation in the technology through 2023. End quote. Indeed, China will be following the emerging AI arms race among global tech giants very closely, and it will want its national champions to emerge on the winning side. Beijing is the latest Chinese city set to host a large artificial intelligence conference this year. On the 13th of February, this Monday, the event will host tech giants including Huawei and Baidu. Tianjin, a port city an hour or so from Beijing by high-speed rail, also announced this week that it will host the World Intelligence Conference in May, not to be confused with the Artificial Intelligence Exhibition, also in May, but being held in the southern megacity of Shenzhen. Of course, the escalating US-China technology war, and semiconductor restrictions specifically, may prove to be highly disruptive to Chinese AI ambitions, in the short to medium term at least. Okay, next up, the Chinese economy. I already took plenty of your time up at the beginning of the episode, so I'll just say quickly, if you're liking the episode, don't forget to hit the like button. And for those who can go that extra mile to support the channel, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, as so much of the country is now painfully aware, three long years of zero COVID has been brutal on the Chinese economy. And while a case can be made for the wisdom of the policy in the first and even second year, the argument for the third year, which was especially damaging, is a much harder sell. The true costs in failed businesses and lost income, not to mention social and human costs, will never be known. A more quantifiable cost, however, is how much the zero-COVID measures cost already financially constrained local governments. This is a question which Chinese financial media outlet Tai Xin is seeking to answer. In a report published today, the outlet writes that while no national statistics are yet available, local authorities' recent budget plans do give us an idea of some of these costs. Taishin calculations based on the government data show that local spending on efforts to contain the virus and vaccinate the public climbed into the hundreds of billions over the last 12 months alone. Quote, the southern commercial hub, Guangdong, China's most populous province, with 127 million people, topped the list with 71.1 billion yuan, 10.5 billion US dollars, of spending. The eastern coastal province of Zhejiang, home of 65.4 million, said costs related to pandemic control totaled 43.5 billion yuan. Beijing, the capital, spent nearly 30 billion yuan. End quote. Jiangxi, in western China, said its pandemic spending amounted to 19 billion yuan. Analysts observe that these numbers are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the costs to local governments. The hit to revenue through lower tax levels due to zero COVID disruptions alone are higher than these amounts. And of course, we have explored thoroughly that China's local governments are under growing pressure to balance their budgets. We remember China's fiscal deficit hit a record 7.75 trillion yuan from January to November last year. Now that zero COVID is behind them, local governments will be hoping for strong economic growth in 2023 in order to refill their empty coffers. Okay, now I wanted to end today's video by observing some passages from the most recent Pathfinder report that Rhodium Group does in collaboration with Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. The latest report looks at the second half of 2022 and looks forward to 2023, asking the question that we who follow China should all be asking, whether or not the recent pro-business shift in policy and rhetoric is merely a short-term tactic by the Chinese government to shore up growth. I will now directly quote some extracts from the report, which I have likely edited for brevity. Quote, In the second half of 2022, China veered from one extreme to the other, with carefully choreographed control followed by sudden turmoil. In October, President Xi Jinping was elevated to an unprecedented third term, underscoring his iron grip on China's Communist Party and the country. Two months later, the chaotic abandonment of zero COVID measures, in place for nearly three years, triggered a nationwide health crisis. Throughout, the Chinese government has continued to claim that the path it has chosen for China's economy and its people is the only right one. Nevertheless, China's economic weakness is pushing leadership to strike a more business-friendly tone. In recent months, Chinese officials have been reassuring a private sector hammered by regulatory crackdowns and 
rolling out the welcome mat for foreign investors who have been turned off by years of draconian COVID lockdowns. The defining question of 2023 will be whether the shift in policy and rhetoric is merely a short-term tactic by the Chinese government to shore up growth. So far, evidence of a more meaningful commitment to structural reform is hard to find. This issue of China Pathfinder update looks ahead to China's post-COVID era and analyzes the two confidences, that of domestic consumers and businesses and foreign investors. The Chinese government needs to rebuild in order to restart the economy. The end of zero COVID restrictions and the resumption of travel and services sector activities for Lunar New Year will bring about an improvement in China's economy, especially the consumer-facing segments in the first half of 2023. However, an end to zero COVID does nothing to remedy long-running structural problems, distress in the property sector, lingering unemployment for new graduates, and weak growth in disposable income all stand in the way of a rebound. China's charm offensive on the international front will also require follow-through, as foreign governments and investors await evidence of the country's commitment to structural reforms. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And I will see you all again on Monday.